Yeah. So we. Is it we, yeah. oh. Yes. Yes, I think so. Okay. Good. Good. Very good. Thank you. So. Um. Yeah. We will be starting in in about eight minutes. Um. Maybe. I could share my screen and yeah. So probably you guys can see my screen now. Um, yep. So what I want to do, I actually want to, um, Yes, um, so there is a bit of a um, yeah. So you all have, I don't know why I can't get into full screen mode. Um, just trying that I can go into a full screen mode and it's not letting me for some reason. Anyway, um, so you all have 12 minutes to introduce your topic and we will have about three minutes for one or two quick questions. Um, uh, maybe we could start the webinar so if people could start coming in um, and then so I have uh, started the webinar, Sean. Yep. Um, so, and those who are starting to come in now, uh, there should be, the so audience can ask their questions in the Q&A panel. So if you look, uh, there are two things. One is a chat box. So you can type in the chat box, um, you know, any comments or whatever. Uh, but if you have a question that you would like to be answered, um, please type that in in the Q and A box, uh, and you can um, you can vote it up as well. So there's an option there to like it, and so on and so forth. And please ask questions. There's no nothing like a lab question. So so please uh, feel free to ask our questions. Okay, so that's uh, basically um, a bit of a um, yeah. Um, a bit of a housekeeping um, and yes so that's basically it um, so Can we, we have uh, yeah so we have Caroline joining in as well so Caroline hello if uh, so you are in mute so we can't hear you um, yeah okay so would you like to share your screen just to check Sure. Everything is working fine. Um, yep. Thanks. We can hear you, which means audio is fine. So Just I'm going to end up sharing if... this desktop and then presenting. Yeah, um, great. Like this. Do you see the title slide rather than my notes? Yep. Yes, okay. exactly. Great. Okay, cool. Um, so we are all set. Um, so we'll start in about four minutes. Um, and I don't know, Carolyn, you start, you joined a bit late. So you have 12 minutes. Um, so, so you have 15 minutes, but uh, so 12 minutes for the talk and three minutes for uh, quick one I or talk, two questions. I, I did try it last night. It's exactly 12 minutes and five seconds. So don't get too nervous. It's going over a few seconds, but it'll end. <laughs> Yeah, probably you will talk a bit faster doing the actual thing. That's my experience. I, I do that. Uh, yeah. So most probably you will be fine. Um, and um, afterwards, uh, we will be able to hopefully take a few more questions um, once all the talks finish. Um, yeah, so if uh, you can remain online, um, and if there's time, we can have a 
you know, we can have a, another round of questions for you. Um, okay, so yeah, we still have some time. And for the panelists, you guys can feel free to leave your video on to be kind of a, an attendee panel, or you can turn it off, whatever you prefer. I'm going to end up turning mine off after my uh, talk because I'm going to need to move locations right after my talk. No worries. I might not be really very, I'm not confident my connection will stay good for, for questions after my Q&A session. Sure. Yes, so Sean is helping us with the, um, um, with with the with, with moving things uh, smoothly. So thanks a lot, Sean. Um, <laughs> yeah. So he's our tech guy. He's our tech guru for the session. Um, cool. So you guys are in very different places. It's for me. It's about midnight about to be midnight in two minutes. Um, and for some of you, it might be, it seems like uh, Emma has a bit of a sunshine. Uh, mm -hmm. So it seems like, a, and Sean as well. So you both are in UK, right? So, yep. yeah, for OJ it's uh, probably evening as well. Not sure about Carolyn, she's in, uh, yeah, that mod, so. Cool. Um, so, yeah, we'll be, so if you can start your, uh, like if you can share your screen, Emma, and uh, yeah, we'll be going, um, we are already Thanks, live. <laughs> yes, anyway, just, uh, I had a problem, <laughs> so I went live already. Anyway, thanks. Yes. Um, um, so can you see this okay? Yes, I can see that very well. Um, so it's still a few seconds before we start. Um, so the first the first talk for the session will be given by Emma Wilson. Uh, she is research assistant at the University of Edinburgh. And her talk title is Automated Screening to Assist a Systematic Living Summary of Primary In Vivo Focal Cerebral Ischemic Stroke Research. So it's all yours, Emma. Thank you. And, and sorry, it's a bit of a mouthful of a title. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk today about how I'm um, developing a workflow for this automated uh, screening. Um, so ischemic stroke is a major cause of death and disability around the world. And despite decades of both clinical and preclinical research, there are very few effective treatments as drugs found to be effective in animal models aren't effective in humans with the disease. And so what can we do about this? Um, at the Camaradi's Research Group, based in the University of Edinburgh, we specialise in the systematic review of preclinical data, such as animal or in vitro studies. Uh, we find that planning new research based on a systematic assessment of existing research is an important research investment and it reduces research waste. Um, systematic reviews are used to identify and summarise and critique all uh, studies related to a given research question, they help inform improvements uh, in research quality and translation of research findings to the clinic. Um, however, they're very time consuming to complete and by completion, uh, the results are often out of date. Um, so we've come up with this sort of concept of a systematic living online evidence summary, also called SOULS. Um, it's an up-to-date resource of all studies investigating a particular research area, such as ischemic stroke. And it follows the same basic approach as systematic reviews in that it identifies studies from multiple databases, it removes duplicate studies and screens the studies for relevance. Um, however, these processes are regularly repeated uh, to maintain the up-to-date data set. And uh, that's the living component of the systematic evidence summary. Um, and additionally, uh, each study is categorised or tagged for things like study type and study quality, 
um, according to existing checklists. Uh, this resource can then be built into a freely available online platform uh, to be used by other researchers, clinicians, and policymakers uh, to make decisions on future research or which drugs to carry forward into clinical trials. Um, in order to realistically achieve this, um, because of the resource required, there must be some element of automation used to speed up this. Um, so the aim of this project and the focus of this talk is the development of the workflow to automate the identification of relevant studies for um, uh, ischemic stroke. Um, so we used a, a machine learning algorithm, it's a bag of words machine learning algorithm, um, which looks at the, um, the specific words used in titles and abstracts of study and sort of um, uses that to categorize and um, identify which ones may or may not be relevant. It was developed by um, Professor James Thomas and it's been used um, for study screening for systematic reviews um, in multiple projects, but it must be retrained um, for every project to identify the specific inclusion criteria that you're looking for. Um, so in this project, we conducted a, a systematic search of PubMed in December uh, 2019 using terms related to focal cerebral ischemia, and we dual screened uh, a random sample of the studies for inclusion based on the um, criteria outlined on this slide. Um, and the agreements between screeners were reconciled by a third screener that was, um, disagreements, sorry, between screeners were reconciled by a third screener blinded to who made the first decisions um, so they wouldn't be biased. Um, screening a random sample of 4,000 PubMed studies identified only 130 studies that were relevant to the inclusion criteria. Uh, this was a very low yield of relevant studies, so we supplemented the data with 786 studies that we knew were relevant um, because they'd been identified in previous Camaraderie systematic reviews of ischemic stroke research. So in total, we ended up with 4,786 studies, each known to be either relevant or irrelevant, and we randomly distributed these into a training and validation set to test the algorithm performance. Um, so we passed uh, these sets through the, the algorithm and found that it performed optimally with a sensitivity of 95%, a specificity of 98% uh, and a precision of 92% as well as an accuracy of 97%. Uh, this is shown here on the rock curve by the red line. Um, and this indicates our chosen threshold, and it's the sort of the point where the red line and the this black curve uh, intersect. The black curve represents um, all the, the thresholds that the algorithm selected. So the red line is the optimal one. Um, so the next step was to develop an automated screening workflow that could be used to allow the generation of the living online evidence summary um, for the ischemic stroke research. So we formed a systematic search of both PubMed and Embase in August 2020 uh, to generate a more up-to-date data set um, of all potentially relevant studies. Um, PubMed we searched automatically with a free API key um, we don't have access to an M-based API, so we had to do those manually. And we excluded Web of Science because they don't have an API and you can only export about 500 studies at a time, which wasn't feasible. Um, next, we removed duplicate studies semi-automatically using deduplication software that's been developed um, by one of my colleagues at Camaradis. There's a little link below. Um, and finally, we were able to pass the unique, potentially relevant studies through the trained machine learning algorithm to identify uh, the relevant research. Um, so as you can see in this flowchart, um, 
there was almost a million studies in total from PubMed and MB combined. Um, after removal of duplicates, uh, we ended up just over three quarters of a million, so a massive amount of data. Um, but from this, the machine learning algorithm only identified um, 27,000 relevant studies. That's about 3.6% um, of the total unique studies and is similar to the 3.3% um, that were identified from the random sample of PubMed that I mentioned earlier. Um, so as you can see, the yield of relevant studies is still very low. Um, manually screening three quarters of a million would have been a huge waste of time and resource. I did also think, you know, why, um, why do we have so many studies um, pulled up in the search that aren't actually relevant? A lot of them were uh, things like reviews, which we excluded because um, it's not primary research. Um, and also I wanted to keep the search term rather broad um, just so we didn't miss anything um, accidentally. Um, but I did calculate, if you assume that one study takes one minute to screen the title and abstract of, it would take someone working 24 hours a day, every day, 523 studies to complete screening of um, three quarters of a million. So I'm glad I didn't do that. Um, one of the reasons, um, sorry, we have done that slide. Uh, to conclude, um, Automated screening of systematic search results saves substantial resource and time, especially where the yield of relevant studies is low. And um, the results presented here suggest that the machine learning algorithm used is highly accurate in identifying relevant stroke research and could be implemented in an automated uh, systematic living summary workflow. Um, the next steps for this project are to retrieve missing bibliographic data um, for the included studies. A lot was missing from PubMed and Embase, uh, such as DOIs, um, and these would just be useful for automatic PDF retrieval and to make the resource more useful for potential users um, to find the studies within it. Um, we'll then develop a simple, easy to use online platform to allow users to view, download the data and, and search titles, abstracts or other um, bibliographic data. Um, I also plan to use a subset of this um, 27,000 studies to test um, new automation tools such as machine learning or text mining to tag studies for study type and quality. Um, we've got a tool that we're developing at the moment that is, it looks at risk of bias for studies. Um, so it'd be really useful to see um, how well that works on this data set. Um, and of course that will be the final part of the overall living evidence summary workflow. Um, so that brings me to the end of my talk. And um, thank you for everyone who's attended. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you to my co-authors for helping with this. I've also included a, a link to our uh, research group website in case you're interested in finding out more about what we do. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Emma. It was great and you're exactly on time. Um, so, um, any so we have one question coming in for you. Um, so Uja is asking that does the algorithm only screen the text of the abstract uh, on these databases? Sorry, I missed the, the first word in that. Yes, yeah, so she's asking is it the algorithm only screens the text of the abstract uh, or, you know, what you're actually looking for? So is it like only looking at the abstract or is it also, you know, looking at the title or the contents or? Yeah, so it just looks at the title and the abstract. And um, so it works okay. out from that, yeah. And what um, what were your keywords? Um. The, the keywords, um, I don't have them on the slides, but they are in a, um, 
there in a, a protocol. Maybe if I stop sharing, I can, I'd be able to find the link and send that uh, into the chat. That's um, all right. So is it is it a lot of keywords or how did you how did you come up with them? Because the keywords are more than most important, right? To um, yeah. So um, I looked at um, various um, systematic reviews that were done before on ischemic stroke. Um, so obviously for for the the keywords, there'll be certain parts. So there'll be like this is the part for the stroke, and then maybe you're looking at a certain um, you know, mm. if it's an animal, you might be looking for the species, or if it's a cell, you might be looking for the cell model, or maybe the the drug. So I basically, I I just looked for this first part of the the keywords that were used in the previous systematic reviews, that um, mm. just for for looking for stroke. Um, I I did have a problem the first time where I got a lot more search results, um, because it, it was picking up things like um, coronary ischemia. So I, I added a bit in that says like not coronary ischemia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it down a lot. Yeah, yeah and, and you had different languages. So how do you say so if your keywords are in English, right? So yeah, so, uh, so but you so, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so it's it's just searching English databases. So it's searching PubMed and Embase. Um, but you do get okay. um papers that are maybe in Chinese or in um Russian or other languages. Um, sometimes systematic reviews in the um, the full text retrieval decide to exclude studies if they they don't have it in in English, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the plan for this is to find some way of translating these papers so we can still get the data from them. Uh, we mm -hmm. won't be able to do it in an automated way. Um, for instance, if there isn't um, there's usually an English abstract because we're just looking at English databases, but if the full text isn't in English, we won't be able to uh, get data automatically okay. from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks a lot again. It was very nice and uh, yeah. very good luck for the next phase of your studies uh, and your research. Uh, thanks a lot again. Um, okay, so we next move on to our next speaker. Um, who is Dr. Caroline Robertson. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Dartmouth College. Um, and the title for her um, talk is Sensory Processing in Autism, uh, Translational Markers and Circuit Level Insights. Um, so uh, Caroline, it's all yours. Thank you, Adil. So I'm going to jump right in, starting with a bit of the motivation behind our work. A major limitation in autism research today is the lack of robust nonverbal paradigms that can move across species and afford some meaningful connection between animal and human level findings in this field. Across different species, we currently employ very different measures of autistic traits, ranging from, say, marble bearing tasks in mice to theory of mind tasks in humans. This of course poses a difficulty for drawing inferences from one level of analysis that might apply to another, both in the context of basic science, as well as for drug development. Sensory paradigms seem to hold a lot of promise for translational research. After all, the circuitry of sensory cortex is relatively well characterized in the human brain. The computations involved in sensory processing are relatively conserved between animals and humans. And finally, sensory symptoms lend themselves to nonverbal assays as they can often be passively measured via evoked responses. So focusing on sensory symptoms might be able to play a big role in autism research, helping us to start to bridge the gap between the detailed models of the autistic brain that we have from animals with studies of human behavior. Now this seems like a pretty reasonable first thought but it's based on the assumption that sensory symptoms are, in fact, a core part of the autistic phenotype, which is an assumption that actually hasn't been widely held in the autism field. So starting with the very first reports of this condition in 1943, the sensory symptoms have largely been considered epiphenomenal, secondary consequences to a core deficit in social cognition. So it seems appropriate to ask whether sensory symptoms are, in fact, core a core symptom domain in autism. You could imagine that they're not, 
There are many possible developmental routes to sensory traits. For example, it could be that just a lifetime of reduced social interaction encourages different patterns of sensory seeking or avoidance behaviors of people with autism. Or it could be that sensory symptoms are simply fallouts of disruption in a more centralized process in the brain, like an attention or anxiety, which might modulate sensory signals in the brain, but doesn't necessarily originate in sensory circuitry. In both of these cases, it would be important to understand the sensory symptoms because they affect a person's life. But these symptoms might not give us a handle on translational neural circuitry insights or be promising as early diagnostic tools. On the other hand, if sensory symptoms are in fact primary traits in autism, we'd like to know that they are present in early development, as this would suggest that they're not later adaptations to an atypical social environment, but are instead part of the developmental trajectory of autism. Second, is there evidence for a genetic basis of sensory symptoms? And finally, do sensory symptoms arise from disruptions in sensory dedicated regions of the brain, potentially reflecting local changes in the neural circuitry of a dedicated sensory area, which might be able to be modeled in animals? So starting with the first question. In fact, sensory symptoms have been clinically observed in autism as early as six months of age. These symptoms and sensation are predictive of social deficits at that same age, as well as the observed uh, amount of repetitive behaviors. And some studies suggest that they even predict eventual diagnostic status, where children with higher sensory traits at 12 months are more likely to go on to receive an autism diagnosis at age three. So we might think that sensory symptoms, if they were empirically measured at this age, rather than just clinically observed here, they might be able to represent good early diagnostic markers of this condition. But are they heritable? Is there evidence for a genetic basis of sensory symptoms? The strongest evidence for a genetic basis of sensory traits to date really comes from mouse models of autism, such as the recent work by Lauren Orifice and David Ginty, which show strong causal evidence between genetic changes that have high penetrance for autism in humans and sensory phenotypes. At the human level, autistic sensory traits show relatively high heritability in twin studies, as well as high genetic overlap with social autistic traits in those populations, again, suggesting potentially a link between these symptom domains, these highly disparate symptom domains. Moreover, family design studies show that the parents and siblings of individuals with autism report higher levels of sensory traits relative to the general population. And this is especially true in families that are thought to have a higher genetic liability for autism because they have multiple individuals on the spectrum. So together, these studies suggest a genetic basis for sensory symptoms in autism, which might even overlap with the social symptoms. Together, this is strong preliminary evidence for sensory symptoms as core phenotypic domains in autism. Turning now to the final question, whether sensory symptoms in autism stem from neural changes in sensory areas of the brain. I'm going to answer this question simply from the perspective of one line of work from my own lab, although there are many other answers out there in the literature at this point. Here in this line of work, we were interested in testing a specific and widely held hypothesis of autistic neurobiology, which is that certain regions of the autistic brain might be marked by a disruption in GABAergic signaling. If this were true, we reasoned that it would likely have dramatic impacts on vision, and especially on visual functions that are known to rely on inhibitory interactions in the brain, such as binocular rivalry. Binocular rivalry is one example of a large class of what we call bistable perceptual phenomena, which are known to tax competitive inhibitory interactions in the cortex. This is because during rivalry, individuals are presented with visual conflict two different images are shown to their left and right eyes, in this case, a green and a red image. And the interesting thing about rivalry is that due in part to reciprocal inhibition between left and right eye neurons and early visual cortex, you rarely see those two images at the same time. Instead, the brain naturally suppresses one of the two images from awareness in alternation. So I have a little cartoon over here in the left panel trying to illustrate what the experience of rivalry is like as you switch between seeing the left and the right eyes image and a mixture of the two in between. And this here is a compelling recent video of ocular dominance column activity in V1 during rivalry, 
in which you can clearly see the same coordinated alternating activity between left and right eye ocular dominance columns. So rivalry is clearly a low level visual phenomenon that depends on EI balance and visual cortex. And the basic intuition in autism is simply that if inhibition were weaker in the autistic visual system, rivalry dynamics would be affected. Rivalry would be slower and the ability to suppress one of the two images from awareness would be weaker. So instead of seeing either the red or the green image, people would see a mixture of the two for longer with neither of them fully suppressed. And in previous studies from my lab, we in fact observed that binocular rivalry was altered in individuals with autism. Rivalry switch rates are substantially slower and the depth of perceptual suppression is reduced in adult individuals with autism. These visual effects predicted clinical measures of autistic symptom severity where individuals with slower rivalry or weaker suppression showed higher levels of autistic symptoms. And using neuroimaging to look at GABA and glutamate levels in the early visual cortex, we were able to identify a link between the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA and reduced perceptual suppression in autism. So these findings suggest a striking difference in binocular rivalry dynamics in autism, which might be a good index of altered inhibition in visual cortex. But so far, what we've had are behavioral observations. Next, what we wanted to know is what this dynamic looked like in the brain. But how might we visualize rivalry dynamics in the brain in humans? To do this, we developed a non-invasive imaging method to measure the rate of rivalry in autism using EEG by frequency tagging the images that are presented to the left and right eyes. So you can see the left image is flickering at 8.5 hertz and the right at 5.7 hertz on the screen. So from a single trial, we get data like this. While a subject's perceptual experience is alternating between the left and right eye percepts, so the frequency bands corresponding to the left and right eye images are alternating. You can see they're oscillating in counterphase, the left eye here in red and the right eye here in green. They rise and fall in alternation and coordination with the perceptual report above. What I'm gonna show you next is individual data. So that was previously just a single trial from one person, but here I'll show you average individual data from two participants, starting with the control individual. And I'm gonna plot the response amplitudes for the left and right eye frequency bands, averaged around the time point here when a person said that they switched from the right to the left eye percent. Here you can see that activity in the right eye frequency band is high before the perceptual switch, and it falls as the left eye band rises. The period of this oscillation is quite quick for this individual, seemingly around two seconds from start to finish. Next, I'll show you data from an autistic individual. You can immediately see that the period of this rivalry oscillation is much slower matching the slower rate of rivalry that was reported behaviorally in perception. And here's the data now shown in a group plot averaging across all of our participants with, who are control individuals in the study. You can see that classic counterphase rivalry oscillation again, and that the period of that oscillation is significantly longer uh, on, on average in individuals with autism, demonstrating a slower rate of binocular rivalry in the autistic brain. One point I'd really like to hit here is that this measure is entirely nonverbal. When we calculate the average oscillation in each individual's EEG signal and train a linear classifier on all of our individuals' uh, average EEG oscillations and amplitudes, and then test an individual's diagnostic status in a leave one out procedure, we can predict a person's diagnostic status, autism versus control, with 86% accuracy. And I'll just linger here to say this is pretty surprising for a low level visual task. To be provocative, I'll also say this level of classification accuracy is actually exactly on par with our current markers of autism in social behavior, such as looking time to the eyes versus mouth regions of a face during a social attention paradigm. But in contrast, this is now a well-modeled task which an animal can do, whether a mouse or a monkey, providing us with a translational marker of autism and visual perception. So in sum, Multiple lines of evidence suggest that autism is not simply, as it's often considered, a disorder of the social brain. In fact, sensory symptoms onset early in development, have a genetic basis, have neural roots in sensory dedicated regions of the brain, 
And moving forward, sensory symptoms seem like a productive tool to shed light on neural alterations in autism. But there's still a lot of work to be done. In particular, it's early days in identifying a battery of tasks that reliably discriminate individuals with autism from controls. It's also important to start trying to move these paradigms across species as they might be hopeful for. And finally, we're really excited about the project of starting to untangle this relationship that keeps popping up between the sensory and higher order symptoms and autism and social cognition, both in terms of their developmental, neural, and genetic origins. So thank you all for listening and I look forward to your questions. And I especially thank my lab and funders and the individuals who've who participated in our research. Oh, I was on mute. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Carolyn. Um, you were actually under 12 minutes. So very well done. Um, yes, so please, um, uh, you know, ask your questions to Carolyn. So we see one question coming in for you. Um, so there's a question from Angelica Tarek. Um, so maybe I could, if, would you like Angela? Oh, okay. So would you like Angela to be answered, to, 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 to have your question, um, to put your question yourself uh, online? So I can get you up. Just give me a second. Oh, okay. So I can, so she's saying that I can ask. So um, so she's saying, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, how did you assess what the subject perceived or how did the perceived stimulus look like? That's a great question. Um, so in this study, in this EEG paradigm, we also are recording behavioral report um, from our subjects. So at the same time as they're, as we're recording these neural oscillations I've been uh, presenting to you, we're also recording uh, button press information continuously. So we've, we've told a person, hold down the left button when you're seeing a green image, hold down the right button when you're seeing a red image, and hold down the up button whenever you're seeing a blend of the two. So neither of the two images is fully dominating your perception. And we train them on this behavioral response um, using rivalry simulation uh, 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 display. So we actually present those images and let them alternate on the screen through a uh, simulated uh, uh, presentation. And then we um, make sure that they're pressing buttons at the right time and they're able to report what they see. We also use that same um, strategy, these rivalry simulations, to make sure that neural oscillations that are just evoked in the brain aren't different between autists and controls. So we will present an image on the screen that is red for a period of time and then falls away and becomes green. And we'll make sure that the autists and the controls have similar ma matched uh, neural oscillations in, res in response to those um, evoked responses. Um, so those are the basic okay. strategies that we take. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have another question coming from Kathleen Perrin. Uh, Kathleen, would you like to come online? Like I can give you permission if you would like to answer, uh, to, to ask a question. Um, hi. Um, can hi. You hear me? Yeah. Hi, thank you, Caroline. Yeah. This is such a great talk and I really like, uh, it's important work and I, I like how you're, how you're tackling this. So I was wondering, and maybe, I mean, I'm not an expert in the field, so I was wondering how, you know, Primates are obviously good at binocular rivalry. They show the phenomenon, and we have great ways to access reports. Um, how, how, what's the state of, of this in mice? So arm. Yeah, that's a, a great animals? question. Um, so I, I mean, there are a couple of questions with mice. First of all, we don't know at all that mice will rival, given the small binocular overlap zone in, in mice. So we're we're yeah. starting to explore this a little bit, this question a little bit with collaborators right now, but. Um, regardless of whether they do or not, whether they're the correct species or not to explore this in, this paradigm is now, it's entirely a neural readout, right? So although we are recording button presses from our, our, our human individuals, these rivalry oscillations are, um, don't require verbal report to analyze. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the frequencies, average frequencies that I was displaying from our, our participants simply come from taking this ongoing oscillation between the left and right eye frequency bands, computing different scores, doing a Fourier transform, and asking what is the average rate of oscillation in that data. Um, none of that requires 
you know, learning, training, or verbal report. Um, it's not dissimilar to say um, the video I showed you earlier from the optical imaging study of uh, the macaque um, early, uh, you know, V1 uh, um, alternating as, as the monkeys just actually, it's anesthetized in this study and looking at a, at a rivalry display. Right, yeah, no, and that, that, that's really good. So, I mean, do we know, I mean, again, this is a naive question maybe, do we know how much, you know, whether mice have enough binocular overlap to even show these fluctuating effects at the neuronal level? Not yet. It, There's some, maybe. We want to find <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Okay. okay, thank you. So thank we you. are to return. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Thank you. And thanks a lot, um, um, Carolyn, for this enjoyable talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks. So we will next move on to Uja Parekh. Uh, and uh, Uja is a um, master's student in biomedical sciences. Uh, and she's studying in Mumbai, India. Um, so, and the title of her talk is Current status of nanomedicine in global stoma uh, multiform a systematic review. Um, so, um, yeah, Uj, it's all yours. Thank you so much. So, I'm going to be speaking about the current status of nanomedicine in glioblastoma multiform. So, we performed a systematic review, and the paper was co authored by Dr. Rishikesh Sarkar. So glioblastoma is a primary brain tumor, which is classified by WHO as a grade four astrocytoma and is associated with a very poor prognosis and an overall survival of a mere 15 months after diagnosis and therapy. Without therapy, a patient may only survive for up to three months or slightly more. Nanotechnology is an up and coming field which studies nanoparticles and its applications in various fields of science. In cancer biology, nanotechnology has been exploited for diagnosis, imaging, and even therapy. Nanoparticles usually range from 1 to 100 nanometers in size, and a nanometer is 1 billionth of a meter. Okay, so in this image, I uh, have displayed how nanoparticles can be exploited to treat a glioblastoma tumor, which usually arises in the subventricular zone of the brain. Owing to its small size, the nanoparticles can easily cross the blood-brain barrier. Also, because of its high surface area, it can be conjugated with multiple antibodies that can bind to tumor antigens. Another interesting uh, property of nanotherapy is enhanced permeability and retention effect that is seen in tumors. Uh, because of leaky angiogenesis, which is a major hallmark of cancer, the nanoparticles can easily diffuse through the tumors and be retained within the tumors uh, because of lack of the uh, lymphatic drainage. So because of this, the nanoparticles get enough time to act on the tumors and induce apoptosis or necrosis in these tumors. Uh, so the cytotoxicity could be uh, imparted because of the nanoparticle itself or because it carries certain drugs like temozolomide, cytotoxin, or doxorubicin that induces apoptosis in these cells. Uh, in figure C, you can see the relative size of nanoparticles, which is much smaller as compared to the other cells in the body. So the aim of the study was to understand the advances of nanotechnology in treating GBM in humans. We all know that in preclinical studies, nanotechnology has shown vast promise and amazing results. However, we do not know the efficacy of nanotechnology in human patients, for which we performed a systematic review. So we collected all clinical, relevant clinical trials from databases such as PubMed, Cochrane Library, clinicaltrials.gov, and Google Scholar between 2001 and 2020. Uh, we got around 24 papers of which 11 were excluded because they were ongoing clinical trials, had been terminated because of uh, life-threatening side effects. All the trials were completed, but the results had not been posted. Uh, after which we were left with 13 studies of which three were excluded because they did not match the inclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria set for this paper were that the patients must be greater uh, than 18 years of age and the patient should be alive while the studies were carried out. So autopsy studies were excluded. Also the follow up period should be more than eight months. Finally, we were left with 10 studies that were included in the qualitative synthesis. So uh, the three most common nanoparticles that were observed were superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, also known as peons, which have a magnetic core. 
uh, this can be exploited by stimulating these nanoparticles with electro uh, magnetic field and it can induce hyperthermia in the tumor tissue causing necrosis or death of tumor tissue liposome is another popular nanoparticle that can encapsulate drugs uh, within the aqueous layer and it can also be coated with polyethylene glycol that stabilizes its um, properties and also increases the therapeutic index of the drug Uh, the liposomes can also carry human genes like the interferon beta gene that can be transported to tumors to kill the cells a novel technology that was exploited in one of the studies was mini cell mini cells are basically bacterial cells derived from salmonella typhimurium which act as nanoparticles within themselves and can attach tumor antigens and induce immune responses further drugs can also be encapsulated within these mini cells so we had a total of 225 patients evaluated in the systematic review of which 66 belong to the primary gbm subgroup and 159 to the recurrent gbm subgroup the baseline characteristics were studied so we saw that more males than females were affected the median age of the population was 53.25 years molecular markers such as mgmt promoter methylation EGFR expression, MDR1, MRP proteins were molecular markers that uh, indicated poor prognosis of glioblast, uh, good prognosis of glioblastoma. Whereas markers such as TNF alpha, IL1, beta, IL6 were poor prognos uh, poor prognostic markers. The time of induction of therapy also varied from study to study. Basically, uh, the nanotherapy clinical trial started after one to sixteen months in primary GBM patients, whereas in recurrent GBM patients they started between six months. and 14 months which is 24 to 54 weeks it was also seen that all these patients who were included in the clinical trial for nanotherapy also underwent prior treatment such as surgery radiation chemotherapy and immune immunotherapy because of which the sole effect of nanotherapy was not evaluated in these studies the median kps which is the karnofsky performance scale was also shown uh, which is an indicator of the quality of life so higher the kps value better is the quality of life for the same or for the primary gbm patient sample it was 90 and for recurrent gbm 80 the outcome measures that were evaluated were duration of treatment which were very vaguely given in the papers but mostly were for 8 weeks the follow up period also varied across studies but were greater than 8 months the median overall survival was the primary outcome measure evaluated in this study which showed how long a patient survives after nanotherapy treatment in primary gbm patients the uh, survival period was 6.75 months and for recurrent gbm 9.7 months overall the overall survival was 8.2 months mgmt methylation which is a good prognostic marker of gbm was also evaluated in a very few number of patients of which 46.5% were positive and had a longer overall survival the mean progression free survival which basically indicates the time before which a recurrent tumor occurs uh, was quite low for primary gbm which was 2.3 months the rate for the same was 32 uh, 30.2% in recurrent gbm we saw that it took 3.92 months before another tumor recurred in the brain and the rate was 8.2% overall we saw that 19.2% was the progression free survival rate and 3.11 months was the period before a tumor recurred the median kps was also evaluated after treatment however this parameter was not given in most studies so the pri after primary G uh, after treatment of primary gbm the kps reduced that is the quality of life reduced whereas in recurrent gbm the quality of life improved after nanotherapy when it increased to 90 from 80 macdonald's criteria was another uh, parameter that was evaluated CR stands for complete response and basically indicates that the tumor has regressed completely and will not be shown on an image or uh, like a CT scan. PR stands for partial response in SD for stable disease. So it was seen that the complete response was uh, far more uh, relevant in primary GBM tumors than in recurrent GBM tumors. Uh, it was also the results were also compared with bevacizumab, which is an anti-tumor therapy. it was seen that bevacizumab uh, had larger trials with larger number of patients and also the overall survival was far more than uh, what we were observed for nanotherapy as indicated in the red boxes the side effect profiles were also seen 
it was shown that 35 adverse side effects were seen in total between primary and recurrent GBM. The life-threatening side effects were pulmonary embolism, cerebral edema, pneumonia, mucositis, hypophosphatemia, and thermal stress was also induced in the brain that caused severe cerebral edema when the nanoparticle was applied to the surgical cavity. The most common side effects were myelotoxicity, vomiting and nausea, and palmoplantar erythrodysesthesia, which is basically rashes seen on the palms and the soles. It was also seen that recurrent GBM patients saw far more uh, severe side effects as compared to primary GBM patients, and the incidence of side effects was larger in recurrent GBM. So what we observed from this study was that no standard protocol was followed across studies because of which we observed a huge data gap. And we could not uh, analyze the outcome measures across these studies because of which we were not able to perform a meta-analysis. However, from the results that we got, we could conclude the nanotechnology does improve the overall survival in patients, especially in the recurrent GBM patients, as compared to the primary GBM patients. It is possible that the primary GBM patients had very aggressive tumors owing to the location of the tumor or because of the molecular or immunological profile. We also noticed that the sample size was very small uh, and we need larger studies or multi-center clinical trials with uh, all trials following a standardized protocol universally in order to get proper results and in order for anybody to do a meta-analysis to get better results uh, to evaluate the efficacy of nanotherapy. It was also seen that bevacizumab, although improves the overall survival of the patients uh, far better than nanotherapy, bevacizumab also causes a lot of side effects, which are far more severe as compared to nanotherapy. And therefore, nanotherapy can also be considered as good an alternative as bevacizumab for treating glioblastoma cancers. To conclude, the median overall survival for 225 patients was 8.2 months. The progression-free survival rate for, uh, was 19.2%. And the mean progression free survival was 3.11 months. The quality of life uh, improved overall for na after nanotherapy. And that nanotechnology is at the moment only an adjunct therapy and cannot be used solely for the treatment of glioblastoma. Therefore, new and standardized protocols must be developed in order to firstly get homogeneous results and to understand the efficacy of nanotherapy in humans. Yes. I would like to thank Dr. Rishiki Sarkar for mentoring me uh, while writing this paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Uja. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, very nice talk. So um, we, have, we have almost on time. So we probably we could have one quick question from audience. Is there anyone who wants to ask question? Please go ahead. Um, okay, maybe I could ask. Um, so um, one of the things is, uh, what was the, uh, how old the tumors were at the time of, um, of the treatment? So uh, did you look at that? So, because I didn't see that you, yeah. Uh, right, so uh, that part was the time of induction of therapy. So it was seen that most of the patients were had already undergone prior treatment before they started the clinical trial for nanotherapy. So it so happened that some patients, uh, the tumor was as old as one month, or it also was 12 or 30 months old when the th nanotherapy clinical trial started. So there was no inclusion criteria set for these clinical trials where they only included mm. tumors that were uh, of a certain age. So there was a lot of variability and heterogeneity even uh, observed for the age of the tumor. Awesome. Yeah, because that would mean the survival rates and all that. Okay, good, 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 good. So we are very on time. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Ujay. It was a great talk. Uh, you did cover a lot of uh, information in that. It was a new topic for me and I learned a lot. Thank you. Um, okay, so this brings us to the end of this session. Um, I would like to thank Sean, Sean Martin, who was uh, at the back end hand, ha handling, uh, um, you know, uh, the IT and this, you know, uh, technology at the back end. So thanks a lot for, uh, thanks a lot to him. Uh, and thanks, of course, to all the speakers, uh, all three speakers who did a great job. And also 
Uh, thanks a lot to the attendees for their questions and uh, and coming to and joining us for, for this session. So thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Again, bye bye. Thank you. All right, we are officially live on YouTube. I'm going to paste that link here. All right, so let's just give it one more minute. Uh, yeah, let, let let's, people give, arrive. let's give a bit of time to people for joining. Okay, so it's uh, exactly 5 p.m. UTC, so I guess we can start. Hello everyone, I'm Matteo Mancini and I will be uh, chairing this session. I have uh, Richard Lange as uh, the back host who will take care of uh, the technical side of the things. And we have, uh, we had uh, three wonderful speakers. The third speaker may not join because he's having trouble with his computer, but uh, we still have uh, two wonderful speakers. And uh, I will introduce the first one that is uh, Pablo Martinez for, uh, the, from the Italian Institute of Technology, who has been building a bridge between experimental EG data and computational models. And I'm very curious to hear about it. Pablo? So thanks, Matteo, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Today I will talk about an evaluation of models for estimating the electroencephalogram EEG from networks of spiking neurons. So the leaky integrated and fire network model has been widely used uh, to simulate and describe cortical dynamics. Just briefly, it has two populations of uh, point neurons, pyramidal cells and interneurons with recurrent connections between them. And typically there are uh, external input, like for example, they represent cortical cortical input or thalamic input. Uh, typically the common uh, simulation output of this model are spike times of both the uh, inhibitory and excitatory populations uh, but also membrane potentials and synaptic currents. Uh, however, the problem is that uh, point neurons reduce the morphology to a single point in a space, and with a single point in a space, we cannot uh, generate uh, extracellular potentials, and in turn, we cannot generate the EG. Uh, Pablo, sorry to interrupt. Just to let you know, we can see your we're seeing your notes view, not your full screen view. If you that's what you want. The full screen, or we see your notes and your next slide. Ah, okay, sorry. I will exit the... Like this, you still see the, the notes? We see your uh, PowerPoint now. Only the PowerPoint. Sorry? So like this is okay or? If, if you'd like. I'm just not sure if you wanted us to see your, your notes and your next slide view. But, but this is also the next slide. Uh, yes. Do you want okay, to maybe if, to I, if to I share the... To slideshow and uh, start, uh, we see if... Uh... We see just the, the, the slides. Maybe if I share the, the, the screen and not the presentation. Let's see.
So if I share the screen and now I do like this. Again. Well, we, we can see your notes again, but uh, I, that might be fine. Um, so why, why don't you yeah, I continue? Guess it's okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll continue like this. So here, the problem is that, uh, as I said, we cannot generate the, uh, the EG from uh, a network of point neurons. So uh, we cannot uh, compare directly the simulation outputs of a leak interior and fire network model with uh, empirical recordings of the EG. We can ask the question if, uh, is there any way to compare empirical EG with uh, some kind of uh, prediction or estimation, what it is called also proxies, from the simulation outputs of the leaky internet and fire network model? And the answer is yes, we can use the hybrid modeling approach introduced by Hagen 2016. And briefly, what we do is that we simulate the point neural network. We collect the spiking activity from all the neurons in both the inhibitory and the excitatory populations. And then in parallel, we create a network of multi-compartment neurons with a realistic uh, three-dimensional morphologies. We assign a one-to-one -one mapping between point neurons and multi-compartment neurons. And then we inject the spikes generated by the point neural network as presynaptic activity into the multi-compartment neurons. By doing this, uh, we can Create, recreate again the cortical dynamics of the point neural network, but now with the multi-compartment neurons, we can simulate a realistic EEG that we will call the ground truth EEG. And with this EEG, we can compare prediction from uh, example proxies of the point neural network. Like for example, the firing rate, uh, AMP and GABA currents, uh, the membrane potential, or some type of uh, linear combinations between these uh, variables. What we did in this work was to evaluate the accuracy of these proxies uh, in estimating the EEG across different network states of the leak integrated and fire network model. These network states uh, capture some of the main properties of cortical neurons in terms of individual spiking and also in terms of uh, oscillatory activity of the network. And uh, briefly, I will go to one of the main results of our work and that is the total accuracy of the proxies in estimating the EEG. And the total accuracy is uh, calculated as the amount of the variance of the EEG that is captured by every proxy. And we can see that for, so for these proxies that we evaluated, the fine rate, AMP and GABA currents, the membrane potential, the sum of synaptic currents, the sum of the absolute values of synaptic currents, the DLFP reference weighted sum, that is an optimized proxies uh, proxy to capture the, the LFP. And then in this work, we also introduce a new class of proxies that are called ERWS proxies. And they consist of uh, an optimized linear combination of AMPA and GABA currents. And in this plot, uh, if we compare uh, the performance of the different proxies, we can see that the new class of proxies, the ERWS proxies, outperform all the other proxies. Uh, we also validate uh, our proxies for different configurations of the multi-compartment uh, neurons. Uh, like, for example, as illustrated in this figure for different morphologies, uh, morphologies of the pyramidal cells, but also in a different set of experiments, uh, we also tried to change the distribution of synaptic currents on pyramidal cells. And in a different set of uh, uh, simulations, we also changed the position of the EG electrode on, over the head model. So just to sum up, uh, it's important to interpret the EEGs uh, in terms of the underlying uh, neural mechanisms. So we can compare empirical EEG with predictions from in silico models. Uh, we've shown that it's possible to approximate the EEG uh, by using the output, the simulation outputs from the leak integrated and file network models. And in this work, uh, we propose an optimized linear combination of AMPA and GABA currents, the ERWS proxies as uh, the most accurate estimates of the EG over a wide range of simulation setups. So thank you very much for your attention. And let me also thank my supervisors, Stefano Panzeri and Tommaso Fellin at the Instituto Italiano of Tecnologia, and also our collaborators in Norway, uh, Gaute Enebol and Torbjörn Nes uh, from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And also let me say before finishing that this work was developed uh, between the Neural Computation Lab and the Optical Approaches for Brain Function Lab. And also this project was funded by the Marie Curie Action. So thank you very much.
Thanks, Pablo. Uh, let's start with questions. Uh, um, I would like to start. So, um, do you have uh, an upper limit in terms of uh, how many neurons you can uh, um, simulate as a population? Yes, there is an upper limit, and that is a limit. Uh, like in these uh, simulations, we use uh, 5,000 neurons that represent roughly a cortical column. And I, I would say that the, already the, the computational load is high. Actually, we had to use uh, servers. Uh, we run in parallel up to 60 threads or up to 60 MPA processes. And to simulate, for example, let's say, just to, to give you some rough example of the computational load, to simulate uh, just 10 seconds uh, with a time step of uh, 0.1 millisecond uh, for the point neuron network we needed like uh, 15 or 20 minutes for the multi-compartment neurons what we did is to simulate every neuron uh, individually because they are not connected between them and that will take also about uh, 30 or four, between 30 and 45 minutes so the upper limit is okay. in terms of just the computational load and do you think uh, just to follow up uh, that uh, with larger computational resources, you would be able to um, simulate uh, kind of a larger area to see, for example, what happens if uh, you have uh, two electrodes instead of one. So you simulate this kind of scenarios where you would want to disentangle the real neuronal responses. Actually, that's a, a very good question because this is one of the future goals that we want to achieve because obviously the EEG uh, integrates uh, the signal from a lot of neurons, not only 5,000. Actually, this is a, a, a quite simplified model. And uh, actually, it could be very, very interesting to be able to simulate larger populations that extend, uh, especially over more than one millimeter. And not only to simulate, as you commented, the different electrodes, but also uh, to see what is the influence of the different uh, regions that we simulate, the different, uh, how the EG depends on the special uh, distance from the electrode. But for that, yes, we will need uh, uh, more powerful computational resources. Uh, like, for example, now in different projects across the world, such as Brain, the Brain Project or the Human Brain Project, they're using uh, super computers to do that. And actually that's the, the future direction that, I mean, that we really want to do it in as a future goal. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. Now I think that we have uh, Lu Wang that asked the question and uh, he can actually ask uh, live since it's here. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is really great work. Um, I have a question. Um, is it possible to do some uh, backward prediction, uh, for example, just, uh, using uh, measured EEG to assess the neural activities? But of course, the EEG might have some act, uh, artifacts. Yes, thank you for the question. That's also uh, a point that we're thinking in our, in our project as uh, future goals. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that could be very, very interesting, actually, to, do the, to, to solve the inverse problem, because here actually what we are doing is the fit forward problem to estimate from the, from the network, from a, model net, a network model to estimate the EG. But actually what would be very, very interesting is to estimate from the EG the, some, some type of network parameters that produce the EG. Like for example, it could be very interesting if you record empirically the EG to estimate what are the ratio between fine rates of excitatory and inhibitory neurons because we know that this ratio, for example, uh, is uh, altered in some brain diseases like uh, uh, autism. So that could be very interesting or to, to be able to record also, uh, I mean, to estimate other type of different network parameters. And for doing that, uh, the work that we, we develop here could be, uh, could be used as a, as a guide, as a constraint for the inverse optimization problem. Uh, in the sense that uh, we can force, for example, now that we know that the synaptic currents have a larger contribution uh, to generate the EG, we can constrain the inverse problem uh, by imposing the condition that the synaptic current should, be, should play a, a very significant role to estimate the network parameters. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds really, really good. I mean, this is really amazing. Uh, is it possible to uh, follow this project? Do uh, do you already have some uh, publications, or there's a website to follow? Yes, we are about to publish uh, the preprint in by archive between this week and the next week. Also, uh, this project uh, has already initiated. I mean, very recently uh, as a Marie Curie project. So. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm going to publish that in a, in a web page. I can actually, later I can post that in the, maybe in the, yes, in the chat, no, right? If post mm-hmm. a link yeah. for the project website. So yes, I, if you are interested, I think it could be very nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have uh, a last question before moving on uh, from uh, Duan Lu. What is your intuition about how the excitation inhibition balance is reflected in EEG signals? Uh, actually, she's here. <laughs> Sorry, Diane. Yeah, no, no problem. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, well, I would say that also we, we carried out um, a similar project in that direction, that is, uh, we did the modeling, in silico modeling, we also recorded uh, um, fMRI uh, during uh, resting state, and also we did experiments in mice. And the, the goal of this project was to uh, see how this uh, ratio between excitation and inhibition could affect the, the, these uh, brain signals, in this case fMRI, but it could be applied also for the EEG. And actually what we observe is that in the frequency domain, uh, this uh, alteration of the excitation inhibition ratio in the network could produce a change uh, in the in the slope of the of the power spectrum, and uh, we also develop uh, different metrics to to uh, to assess what is this uh, changes in the slope and how this change in the slope of the spectrum could be related with this uh, ratio between excitation inhibition. So. Yes, I think also uh, what we did here could be used, uh, the work that we implemented here for uh, the EG could be used, uh, I mean, going in that uh, direction. Yes, that's it. Cool, thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, so... If we have time, could I ask one more question? Because I know we yeah, yeah, please. have a little we'll bit of extra time. Speaker, so yeah, please go. Yeah. Um, so Pablo, uh, I'm curious... Um, yeah, what would it take to verify these simulations in vivo? Well, that's a, a quite a difficult question to answer. In the in terms, I mean, theoretically, we know what it, it, it uh, what you need. Actually, uh, we would need to record simultaneously, and actually, this is something that uh, at Feline's lab they are trying to do to record simultaneously uh, the EEG or uh, also ECOG because it's. But there's some technical issues. It's easier to record, and in parallel with some kind of uh, intracortical activity that could be, uh, like for example, fine rates uh, spikes or LFP or. Uh, and this is an ongoing project that we want to do, uh, but actually there there are uh, kind of uh, difficulties. Uh, well, in terms that uh, here theoretically it's easier to simulate. Uh, the, 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 the intracortical activity and the EEG and to find this uh, correspondence. But when you record EEG, you have the influence from a, a larger area, a larger extension. So uh, it's possible that uh, some factors that we cannot control in the experiment are affecting the EEG. So there is no um, an, uh, quick, uh, that, let's say a direct correlation between the intracortical activity and the, the EEG that we want to record. But I think answering your question, yes, theoretically, the framework is easier to, to do the setup, is to record simultaneously EEG and some kind of intracortical activity. In practice, we, we are finding some difficulties to really to develop this idea. Sounds very interesting, and probably we'll, uh, we will have some time at the end to discuss this a bit more. In the meantime, let's thank uh, Pablo. And uh, let's move to our next speaker, who is uh, Valentin Slepukin from uh, US- UCLA. 
And they will talk about the fascinating use of network models and graph theory for uh, Reitman generator neural circuits. Valentin? Okay, thank you for introduction. So yes, I would like to uh, tell you about how connecti connectivity controls dynamics of resmogenic networks and how to apply it to the prepositional complex. So prepositional complex is a central pattern generator that produces inspiratory rhythm in mammals. And we would like to model it using the network of leaky integrated fire excited neurons with dendritic calcium adaptation. Dendritic calcium adaptation means that the sensitivity of the neurons to the incoming spikes decreases as the calcium the concentration increases. And calcium concentration in turn increases uh, when a neuron receives more spikes. So in a nutshell, the model looks like when the sensitivity is high, the uh, voltage increases of the complex. Uh, it leads to the increase in calcium because of the a lot of spiking increase of calcium desensitizes the neurons. So voltage decreases and the calcium decreases also and the cycle repeats. So we write it down in terms of the equation and we solve this equation numerically and uh, we uh, get uh, this uh, periodic oscillations. So to compare it with experiments, uh, uh, sorry, do you see the new slide? Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, to compare it with experiments, uh, you, uh, so we uh, study the uh, very simple experiment on the external simulation of the bursts. So where the proposed complex is uh, quite sensitive, which means that like you activate just four or a little bit more neurons out of 1000 and it already produces the burst before the time it was supposed to happen. And we study it on three physiologically motivated networks uh, localized where the probability of the connection between two neurons is higher if these two neurons are closer to each other or the Schrenia, where the probability of the connection between any two neurons is the same. And uh, and small world where, which we obtain from Erdoshrenyi by adding some particular types of the motifs. Uh, we uh, look at the probability of the burst and the time to the burst as a function of the number of simulated neurons, and we compare it with the results of the experiment. So the results of the experiment are the gray squares here, and the results of the simulation are the scoured curves, and we see that the best overlapping happens for the case of the Erdoshrenyi network. And it is uh, kind of makes sense because the function of this complex is pretty simple. It's just to produce uh, rhythmic activity. So apparently just the simplest network, which is Erdoshrenyi is enough to cover this function. So to conclude with this external stimulation part, we also would like to understand uh, which features of the network and the stimulated neurons are important to uh, predict whether the burst will happen or not. And we uh, look at the different quantities that we uh, suggest by graph theoretical analysis, and we see which of these quantities is the best in predicting the burst. And we see that uh, the, it, the significant improvement happens if we uh, incorporate synaptic waves in a non-linear way, which reflects the fact that uh, the neurons interact in a highly non-linear way. So, however, this was just uh, activation of the burst. We are interested in a full cycle of oscillation, in a full activity. And uh, for this, we study a simpler model. So instead of uh, leaking integrated and firing neurons, we just look at rate-based model where uh, we characterize the neuron simply by the average firing rate that depends on the voltage as a sigmoid function. Uh, in this model quality will reproduce a phase diagram of uh, the seen in the experiments. Namely, uh, if you kill the neurons, we exit oscillation phase and either end up in high activity or quiescent phase. And it depends on the, uh, what is the uh, sensitivity of the neurons. So we observe in this model that this uh, termination of the oscillation phase happens in a very particular pattern, namely, uh, Mm -hmm. Namely, uh, the oscillation uh, 
terminates via the separation of the network onto the constantly high firing neurons and constantly low firing neurons. So we study this separation in more detail. Uh, so first we explore the O2O couple network, which is like the simplest version of the model. For O2O coupled network, uh, we see that uh, this separation still occurs, which means that it is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So like there was a symmetry auto coupled, but still it separates onto a differently firing parts. This separation occurs as a standard pitch for bifurcation as we change the slope of the sigmoids. Uh, then we would like to study not like more general network, like not auto coupled, but like arbitrary connectivity. Then we first do the uh, simplest possible neuron model, which is on-off neuron. So a neuron either firing or not, which uh, correlates, which is a slope of sigmoid equal, uh, which is like the sharpest sigmoid possible. So uh, then we see that uh, this separation is exotically controlled by the pure topological feature of the network named K-cores. And we see that the phase diagram is, uh, demonstrates the steps and each step occurs when uh, we kill the next K-core of the network. In more general case, so like uh, when we have uh, firing rates based model with uh, non-step function, but with like proper sigmoid, and when we have arbitrary connectivity, we see that uh, particular motifs with more heterogeneous vertex degree distributions uh, are more often for separate states, while homogeneous are more often for oscillating state. Basically, Basically, we see that the, the motifs that are more often in uh, separated states are always more heterogeneous and that are more often for oscillating phase are always more homogeneous, which kind of indicates that indeed separation happens uh, when, uh, when the separation happens when we uh, uh, have uh, like two heterogeneous network. So yeah, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valentin. It was very interesting. Uh, I will start with a question. So since uh, the um, neural network that you are uh, uh, studying here is the one that generates right, can you identify or uh, would you have some idea on how to identify how the frequency of that right we set through network properties or some graph measures? Uh, yes, so the simplest, uh, like in the simple model, let me return to it. So uh, we, mm, let me go back to the very first slide. Sorry, it's a little bit slow. Yes, so, uh, so here uh, the, like the main period of oscillation happens when calcium returns to its uh, equilibrium value. So basically the burst terminates because the calcium is too high and then calcium slowly returns to equilibrium value and then the burst happens again. So basically the, uh, the period of oscillations is almost completely controlled by how fast calcium decays. So basically the period of oscillation is strongly co uh, connected with this uh, tau C. Uh, quantity. However, it's not the only thing that defines it. Also, uh, the question is uh, how sensitive should the network be to so the so that the burst would happen again. So this will uh, be defined by uh, the uh, by this uh, by by the sensitivity. So basically, uh, as we vary like this R zero. Uh, then the network is more sensitive, so then the like the burst will happen early. And as we we write our C, uh, the calcium will de decay slower, so the burst will happen later. Okay, that's quite interesting. While we wait for question from the participants, of course, if uh, Richard or Pablo want to jump in, please do. Um, can you tell a, a bit? Can you tell us a bit more about the experimental part? How did you manage to do those measures? Which uh, um, animal was your model, and how the recording were done? Oh sure. So uh, the experiment was done uh, like in like previous work, so it like was not my work. So, but basically the experiment is done on. 
the slice of uh, reporting complex uh, in vitro that is uh, taken from uh, mice. Uh, so, um, and, uh, so this experiment is done in uh, not in vivo but in vitro. Like it's like more convenient to just study this uh, this activity propagation in just and in the slice. I think they have like from uh, like from like about 1,000 neurons, like from 600 to 1,000 approximately neurons in this slice. And so what they do, they, uh, uh, they modify, uh, like they, gen they genetically modify the mice such that the neurons will be sensitive to the laser activation. So basically they use optogenetics to activate a particular group of neurons and with, and then in this slice, they uh, choose uh, like from one to nine neurons and they see if activation synchronous activation of these groups of neurons by laser uh, results in a burst of activity in the uh, whole network and basically they see that like when you activate like just one neuron it's very rarely but sometimes you still can can get can get the burst from one neuron but like extremely rarely when you go to four it is like almost, it is quite likely, like maybe 80% of cases. And like when you get to nine, it is like almost always. So like when you like activate nine, yours is like almost guaranteed to get the burst. And okay. It sounds quite a, an experiment, both from uh, the experimental side and from uh, the... Yes, so oh. like this experiment like is described in this paper and like the like these results so uh so we hopefully we will publish a paper with like this results in this experiment like in a, uh like maybe like in a couple of weeks yes and like the results about the k course and all this is like we published it in this paper okay and uh, what what happens if uh, you um let's say if you adopt a kind of a targeted attack approach as in other uh, uh, network models. So basically you start removing either specific connection or specific nodes. Is, are there some nodes that uh, the network is able to cope without or it's, uh, it's quite uh, fragile in the sense that it will break immediately? Yeah, basically it is uh, the uh, important feature of this uh, K core. So basically, K core is the in this in a sense the most connected part of the network. So like when when we, we see that like when we remove the nodes that are not the part of the K core, then it almost doesn't change the situation. So basically, when we kind of like remove the outskirts, but when we uh, kill the neurons in K core, it strongly changes the situation. So basically, if you will shut off like the airport somewhere like in Alaska, that like is kind of remote, it won't change the situation. But if you will uh, shut off like the uh, airport in Philadelphia where like all the hops uh, uh, happen, like where all the transfers happens, then like you will strongly disrupt the communications. Yeah, it was a good analogy. <laughs> Any questions from uh, the participants or uh, Pablo or uh, Richard? Yes, I would like to ask, uh, well, first, thank you for the presentation. And, uh, well, first, I have like more uh, like a technical question. Um, how do you simulate in your model uh, this uh, optogenetic uh, stimulation of the in vitro cells? I mean, specifically, which uh, variable of the firing rate model do you modify to simulate this uh, activation of cells uh, through optogenetics? Uh, so for the... Uh, so we uh, study the activation uh, not in firing rate model but in leak integrated fire model and there the stimulation we uh, modify is just insertion of the additional voltage so basically uh, we kind of uh, choose randomly uh, like group of neurons like let's say four neuron out of like our simulated 1000 neurons and we just artificially uh, add the voltage like above the threshold and basically that's how we stimulate it. Basically that's the same what, uh, what laser do. And since the laser does it like in such a way that they produce like few spikes after it. So basically that's what we do. We 
we manually uh, pull, uh, pull them above the threshold of spiking like few times. Like uh, export, like, like an experiment that they reported it was like round seven, so like we just do the same. Okay, thank you. Another question more uh, regarding the experimental part. Uh, do you think that uh, your results will be modified uh, if you repeat the, this experiment with uh, in vivo? Uh, in the sense that in vivo you have more uh, external connections that can uh, influence the behavior of the network. So do, do you expect that maybe in vivo, for example, this uh, activation of four neurons in order to get the, the bars, this result could be modified or? Mm, it's very hard to do this experiment in vivo because the proposing complex is, a, is, uh, is in, band, in, in, in the brain stem. So basically it's very hard to reach it. It's like in the very center of the brain. It's like, like it's basically to get this complex, like, uh, unfortunately, they need to kill the mice. So, like you, you like need to basically to reach it. You kill the mice. Yeah. Thank you. So it's very hard to do anything with it in vivo. In vivo, you can add. So, so like to do experiments with this complex in vivo, you can do pharmacological experiments like adding opioids that would change the sensitivity. And there are like very nice experiments where you change the sensitivity of the neurons by adding some particular drugs, and it also leads to uh, different. Uh, uh, pattern uh, in this oscillation. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. We had a participant that wanted to ask a question, but uh, he, I think he got disconnected. Wait, there is a question. Um, Sotirios, would you like to? I think that's like the to... same person, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Sotirio, would you like to ask the question yourself, or should I go on? Okay, I will do as before. Uh, I will start reading it, uh, but if he joins, uh, it's uh, it will be okay. So in uh, the N versus delta V phase plot, what do the blue plate pixels mean between oscillatory and highly active state? Oh, uh, thank you. It's a, a good question. So what uh, what it what it means uh, is that. Uh, like we can classify oscillations of two types. So like there can be like physical, like true oscillations that like produce the desired rhythm. And this oscillation should be like, should like go as uh, from like kind of low uh, values of voltage to the high values of voltage. So it should be uh, so, so that like they would indeed produce the, uh, the breathing. However, from mathematical point of view, there is also something that is not just fixed high activity, but something that is also kind of like oscillations. And that is like a ripple on the surface. So basically the network does oscillate, but it is always uh, above uh, the threshold. So basically, so it's like, it's like mathematically, it's like purely adequ adequate oscillations, but biologically they just do not uh, do what they do. So we just uh, put them as different colors here to to distinguish them and like at this like with these parameters it's like very just like a sorry just like a small uh, layer so like it's almost not not noticeable but like with other types of parameters that, that are like that are less physiological this area can be like pretty pretty large also and noticeable yes but thank you for the question yes Okay. Uh, in more details, like you can see, like in this paper, like we discuss it there in more details. Yeah. Okay, now I would like to ask uh, a more general question to both Pablo and Valentin. So since okay. both of your work basically is focused on, uh, um, in a way, bridge uh, computational work towards uh, uh, experimental work, um, do you think that... Uh, um, there is chance for having uh, simple models where you don't have to actually know how the, um, the neural tissue is composed at the, the microscopic level, but actually make some uh, simplification? Or do you think that there will be always the case that if you don't know what is happening at the neuronal or molecular level, you would not be able to model that?
uh, well, should I answer first or Pablo should answer first? Like, what should be the order? Uh, as you prefer, who, who, who feels that uh, is, uh, is ready to answer? Can... Well, in my opinion, like, like my, my background is physicists. So I think we can model basically everything is just the thing that like sometimes we, like our models maybe not very uh, close to reality. So basically what we do is like, yes, we do make some assumptions and we try and then we check if uh, we model indeed the process and we indeed obtain the valid results. And if not, we say, well, we, we the, like these assumptions are wrong. So like basically that, that's, uh, that's, how, that's how it can be like, uh, we like uh, it's uh, sometimes we don't like here for example we have no idea about the connectivity and reports and complex we just try some assumptions and it's like like looks like this one can fit and this two doesn't fit that well okay pablo your take well i think that the, um, the classical problem in computational biology in the sense that you always have to find a trade-off between complexity of the model and uh, biological accuracy. And uh, obviously, uh, from my point of view, always you, you should try to get uh, a model that is uh, as simple as possible, but is able to explain the best you can, the biology. And I would say that uh, for some experiments, uh, you need to to, to get a model that is more complicated, more uh, closer to the molecular approach, to the, to the neurons, the neuronal uh, uh, description. But for others, you can get more, uh, a, high, a higher level of abstraction, and you can perfectly, perfectly describe uh, a property of, uh, of the brain function with uh, very simple models. So the, the, the answer <laughs> overall is it depends on what you want to, to describe and what is the experimental paradigm uh, method, methodology that you want to, to, to explain with a model or to complement with a model. Okay. Uh, while you were talking, uh, Pablo, I remember of this slide from uh, one of the lectures in uh, Neuromatch Academy this summer. And basically there was this... Uh, this crazy image where in some way you you had uh, all the uh, scales that you have in a brain from the actual neurotransmitter to the purification pattern. And I wonder what do you think would be a good model to try to take all cross scale or cross scale problems? Like uh, for example, Valentin, you work with network models. Networks are a thing that been shown to work at the different scales in the brain. Um, would you think that uh, um, they could work also in uh, a cross scale in a way that you are able to take into account what is happening at uh, a very small on a very small scale and see what how it uh, um, affects a larger scale? Uh, of course, this cross scaling is a wonderful topic. So there was a topic by uh, there was a few papers by Bill Bialik uh, from Princeton who basically do this like rescale, uh, rescaling procedure on the uh, biological networks where he uh, studies how can uh, the like basically represents the groups of neurons as uh, voxels and like look at the activity of this group and average the activity of this group of neurons like to one node of the network. So basically, uh, it's like is this like procedure of going from like small scale to another to higher scale uh, is very prominent in physics and like it is very important. So it is yes, it is very very important to look how the physics and how the uh, science of the system changes when you change the scale. And in a lot of systems, it is like it it can give to a lot of very important insights. On that okay. topic, Valentin, I wanted to ask you earlier, um, you had this example of using a mean field approximation yes. and 
how uh, that ended up breaking down. Mm -hmm. As I understood it, it, it when you reached yeah. this non-equilibrium regime. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about what the mathematical tools are that are necessary to go beyond mean field statistical models. Uh, so in this case, basically, you ne you need to explicitly uh, say that, uh, like in like basically in, in here here we explicitly say that uh, we may have uh, two distinct population of neurons. So instead of like describing all the network as say, like basically mean field would say that like let's just say that like all the neurons are the same, they are just connected in the same way, so that all our huge system of equations just when uh, just uh, just collapses to a system of just equation for basically one neuron. And if mean field theory breaks, as we see here, we need to say, well, let's uh, go like one step forward and say that like we have as here two types of neurons. Then we have like, well, equations for two types of neurons. Well, it's still, it's a little bit more complex, but still it's like not something horrible and we can actually solve it and like write all this like nonlinear dynamics equations and obtain it and, and solve it. So, uh, and yeah, simulations show that indeed we have kind of two types of system like high firing rate and low firing rate. So we kind of can describe it. If we would have like 20 types of neurons, I guess we would be say like, ah, but fortunately it's just two. <laughs> Okay, and uh, we make it to the 45th minute. So I guess we can uh, wrap up. It was a very interesting session. Thank you both uh, Pablo and Valentin and thank you Richard for uh, working in the background. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, everyone take a break and then uh, join the, the next session. Bye everyone. Oh.